Good afternoon, Facebook family, friends. Welcome to a midday moment for a Thursday. Pastor Craig Ponder coming to you, hoping, praying that your day is going well. Maybe you've had lunch already or uh, thinking about lunch. Uh, so I uh, hope the rest of your day goes good. Hope you're well. Hope your family's good health. And uh, just the blessings of being able to spend some time with you on another day is a blessing that I look forward to. And I hope that you do as well. We want to begin today with a word of prayer and remembering those that uh, our heart goes out to. Uh, a lot of folks that, that are standing in a need of prayer in a lot of aspects. Everything from, from medical worries to, to financial troubles in families and there's just the family dynamics in a lot of homes. We've got a lot of families that are worried about this whole school mess and what school is going to look like and how, how they're going to to respond to that. How do they make it work as parents and grandparents? So um, we certainly think about you today. You know, we certainly lift our hearts to the Lord in your behalf today, asking he'll give you comfort and direction and provision, whatever whatever the answer to that looks like. Uh, only he knows at this point whether this whole thing will work or not, but we trust him and uh, we'll just have confidence that he'll, he'll provide just what it is that we stand in need of. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the blessings of another day, for health and strength that we're able to be up and about those things you've called us to do, uh, equipped us to do. Never help us, help us to never take it lightly or take it for granted. Lord, the privilege we have to, to reach into the hearts and lives of other folk, other folks, other people. God, I thank you for the for the internet. Again, that's a you know, that's an odd prayer to pray, but I truly am thankful that I have the ability to reach uh, folks all over this country with, with just a, a brief passing moment of a uh, of word of your word together, of praying together, just a, just a, a brief moment, Lord, just to, to bless your people. And for that, I think it. I, I, I'm thankful, and I don't take it for granted. I pray God a blessing on many today that our heart goes out to. Lord, we know families today that are truly worried, um, overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. Father, I pray a special prayer for Becca and Brandon Edwards this morning. Lord, a truly uh, dark time they're walking through with their little sweet baby girl. I pray, Lord, you continue to bless and to strengthen as only you can. Provide a, a word of healing and a word of encouragement and confidence to her family. Lord, I pray a blessing on our, our brothers and sisters over at New Victory as they're making final plans for their regeneration conference. I pray, Lord, for every speaker, for every... Uh, a musician, every singer, every part of that, uh, that event, Lord, from the from the start to the finish, Lord, I pray your spirit would be all over it, Lord, that your people would be encouraged, and those that don't know you as their Lord and Savior could be saved as a result. I pray God your blessing on their pastor and all of their leadership team, provide these last minute details that it could come together, Lord, for your glory. And I think I know them guys well enough; they'll they'll be the first to give you glory and praise for it all. And Father, I bless again a, a prayer blessing on many that are that are sick today. I continue to think about um, Jack Young, Lord. Uh, we ask a blessing on on Miss Mary Ward. Heard an update on her last night, Lord. It's not doing just good days and bad days. I pray God you strengthen her and and her family as they rally together around her, Lord. Of course, um, Brother Charles Jones and many of these, Lord, that that it's on this pastor's heart every day. I pray God you'd go to them. And provide God just exactly what it is that they stand in need of. So, Father, for our nation, for our state, for our local governments, for us as church leadership, we pray direction, we pray a blessing upon our country, Father, in a way that we've never ever needed before. We need your touch, we need your mercy, and we need your grace. So, forgive my sin again. Forgive me, Lord, the sin of my heart, the sin of my mind. I pray God I could be a vessel suitable for your glory useful for your purposes today. For all that you do with us today, I'll be the first to gladly praise you for it because I ask it only in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, I uh, <clears throat> got a stack of music downstairs in my study. Some of it filed, some of it not. Let me, let me rephrase that. Some of it filed, most of it not. <laughs> a lot of it's just sitting in books and folders. But, um, as only the Lord can do, he brought me to one this morning that uh, I've not sung in a while, and, 
And I, I love it because it's, it's a sweet song of testimony. It uh, just simply talks about, um, it says, I love him. That's all I want to say. Hope it'll bless your heart today. David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost save knowing Christ. Little John said he is precious while leaning on his bosom. So for a moment, may I humbly test. Did I mention that I love him, how I worship and adore him, when I can see no way he makes a way, and did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he ever made me, I love him, that's all I want. I preach about my Jesus how many songs could I sing about God's love oh there is not enough words enough notes in the music to tell the story of all my Savior's done did I mention that I love him how I worship and adore Him When I can see no way He makes a way And did I mention He's been faithful to every promise He ever made me I love Him That's all I want to say Did I mention He's been faithful to every promise he ever made me I love him that's all I want to say Isn't that a good song? Let me tell you what, I like that song I like that song Did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he ever made me Hey, I like that song Well, we come today to the, to the fourth Fourth message, I guess. I think I said that yesterday. It's kind of confusing. It's the fourth teaching, but it's the third lesson, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, it's the third lesson in a series entitled simply uh, Four Anchors uh, on which to uh, anchor your soul in the stormy times of life. <clears throat> and this series has really had one purpose. It is, is, is meant to remind you of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 19 Hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. You know, I told you that the the um, the idea or or the thought for this this series um, came from Acts twenty seven. There in Acts twenty seven, we find that Luke is is accompanying the Apostle Paul as they're sailing up towards Rome, where he's going to stand trial before the Roman government. And along the way, uh, they encounter a, a unexpected massive storm. And all 206 souls on board that ship were fearing for their very lives. And when the storm does hit, the sailors worked hard, relied on all of their instincts. They, they did all that they had been taught to do, all that they knew to do, working hard to try to, to keep that ship afloat. But after the sailors had done all they knew to do, uh, there came that moment when they realized that, that nothing they could do was going to help the situation that they were in. Verse 20 says that all hope of being saved was gradually abandoned. But then it's in verse number 29 of Acts 27 where Luke writes these words. A non-sailor type didn't understand the dynamics behind it, didn't understand the mechanics or what it was expected of it. All that Luke does is make an observation that fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. At the end of themselves, at the end of all that they knew to do, uh, 
Luke writes that they simply cast those anchors into the sea, uh, into the darkness, into the unknown, and hoped for daybreak. In that series of messages that I preached the first time at New Salem a couple of three years ago, what, I was inspired by the image of 276 men huddled together, fearing for their very lives, wishing for daybreak. And they came to a point in their life where any chance of survival, all their hope of survival, rested on the strength of those four anchors. Well, the first lesson that, that I challenged you with was anchor number one was the promises of God. And I challenge you with the idea that, that we have been given, as Peter says, exceeding and great promises. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4, promises I told you that are great, promises that are promised, that are precious, because they come from one, from a God that cannot lie, and they come from a God that can literally do the impossible. Last time, we looked at anchor number two, and that was the presence of God. We, we analyzed Psalm 139 where David says, Where can I possibly go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And Isaiah says in Isaiah 41, Don't fear because I'm with you. Don't anxiously look about you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. So now, in addition to the promises of God, in addition to the presence of God, uh, today on this Thursday, I want to encourage your heart with a, a third sure anchor for the storms of your life. And I would submit to you as anchor number three, the perfect plan of God. The promises of God, the presence of God, and the plan of God. Can I ask you by way of, of, of beginning today, how good are you at waiting? Hmm? Are you that guy that cuts through the gas station parking lot to avoid sitting at a red light. I've been guilty of that. Um, many of you probably are, are better at waiting than I am. I, I get very restless very quickly when I'm waiting on particularly unknown things to happen, doctor's offices or phone waiting on a phone call, whatever the case might be. But whether you're good at it or not good at it, the fact of the matter is like it or not, all through the Bible, God's people are told to wait on him. And there's a, there's a time comes in our life and I have to determine to believe that God has a plan for all that's going on around me, good, bad, or indifferent. There comes a time in my life where I've got to make the conscious decision to wait on the timing and wait on the plan of the Lord to be fulfilled. You know that in the Old Testament, just the Old Testament, there's no less than 43 verses of Scripture where God's people are told to wait on Him. 43 times God's people, God's people are told to wait. I jotted down just a couple of examples. Psalm 27 and verse 14, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, verse number 7, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And a very familiar verse to almost all of us is Isaiah 40, 31. Those that wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles, run and not get tired. They'll walk and not become weary. That's three out of 43 verses. Now, you, you may be good at the casual kinds of waiting. Waiting at the bank, waiting at the gas station, waiting at the Walmart, or waiting at Red Line, whatever. The, the casual day-to-day -day waiting in life, maybe, maybe you're better at that than, than your neighbor. But what about the more serious and the difficult kinds of waiting? Waiting that it, you're, you're, you have to wait on God's plan to come to fruition. I'm talking about the waiting of, of a single person uh, struggling with the idea of whether or not God has a, a marriage in store for him or her. I'm talking about the, the couple, the childless couple that's anxiously, desperately wanting to start a family and they're waiting on God's plan. I'm talking about the unemployed mom or dad who can't find a job to provide for their family or a spouse that, that sees no way out of a, of a painful, uh, broken marriage, or sick family members waiting for, for, uh, for God to, to bring healing. Uh, there's all kinds of waiting. There's all sorts of examples in our life where we as God's people are expected to, and challenged and directed to wait on the plan of God. One writer that I read after said this, waiting is our destiny. He says, as creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for, 
We wait in the darkness for a flame we can't light. We wait in fear for a happy ending that we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. So for us as Christians, waiting involves a, a daily decision that I'm going to keep trusting. I'm going to keep obeying what God's called and told me to be. Waiting requires a distinct level of confident humility. Humbling myself before God with the understanding that he's in charge and I'm not. God, help us to be a people that can that can come to a place of truly knowing what it means to wait upon the Lord, as Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord, and do so in, in full knowledge that his plan is perfect. There's a scripture in James chapter 5 that speaks to this idea, and I'd encourage you to, to read that chapter sometime, verses 7 through 11 primarily, James 5, 7 through 11, gives us some great instruction as to the importance of patience and and endurance. And James says that when those unexpected storms hit our life, when problems overwhelm us, whether they were expected, anticipated, or where they catch us completely by surprise, the truth is that we all have the same tendencies. We have these tendencies to lose patience, to lose perspective, and, and then at times even try and blame others for the situation that we find ourselves in. But James makes reference in James 5, 7 through 11, he makes reference to one of the greatest examples of, of what it really means to truly anchor your soul in the fact that God has a perfect plan for your life. And the example that, that James cites is Job and the story of Job. He says in James 5, verse 11, you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And I think that's a great example to us today. I think Job is a prime example of what it means to trust in the Lord's plan when the storms of life hit us. Now we know that story. Job describes is described as being blameless, upright, the man that feared God, a man that turned away from evil. Uh, he wasn't sinless, but he was righteous. But yet in spite of his righteousness, and in spite of nearly godly perfection, in an instant, the Bible says that Job lost everything that mattered to him. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, all of his servants are killed, and then seven sons and three daughters. Everything that meant anything to him was lost in an instant. And if you think about that story, there's a whole lot of ways Job could have responded. He, he could have blamed God and he could have said, you know, the, the heck with being faithful. <laughs> Look what being faithful got me. He could have went to bed, pulled the covers in over his head and just stayed there and cried for death. He could have, he could have decided it would be better if he just checked out and no one could really blame him for thinking like that. But there was a situation unfolding in heaven that Job knew nothing about. I, I think that in all of heaven, there might've been this, this hush when everyone watched to see if Satan might have been right in his accusations, because Satan had come to God and says, "Listen, let me, let me, let me, let me see if this Job is <clears throat> is all that he claims to be." So they begin to see his life falling apart, and I just have to—I've got it in my mind. I can just picture all the hosts of heaven wondering how Job would respond. Would would he curse God? Would he point fingers at God and blame God? Would he turn his back on God? But no. That's not how, how he responded at all. There's a great, great verse in Job chapter 1, verse number 20. As all of heaven watched, the Bible says that Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and what? Worshipped. Instead of wallowing in self-pity, instead of panicking in the midst of great loss, Instead of falling under the load, the Bible says that Job got up. He got up. Job arose. As hard as it was to face what he was facing, as hard as it was for him to not understand the plan that was playing out in his life, he had not been privy to the conversations going on in heaven. He had not heard the conversation between God and Satan, and God gave Satan the authority, but you just can't touch his soul. Job knew none of that. 
as hard as it might have been to make sense of all that he was going through, the Bible says that Job got up, pulled himself together, and worshipped. Shortly after that, he would say, naked I was when I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'll be when I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I think it's in that very nature that we find a blessing. It was the very nature of Job to fear and to revere God. It was because he stood in awe of who God was. Job knew that God had a plan for his life. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in full acceptance of God's plan in his life, and though it made no sense to him at the time, Job relied on the faith that he was known for, and he got up. He dug deep into the faith that folks in the community knew him for, knew him to be a just man, knew him to be a righteous man, knew him to be a man that feared God and turned away from evil. Job dug deep and found that connection and came to the place relying on what was outside of his ability. He tapped into that and he got up. My friend, sudden calamity and sudden dev devastation can come into your life too. Job lost all of his property, lost all of his possessions, lost his family, ultimately even lost his own health. The only thing that he had left was a wife and a boil-covered body. And Job didn't understand none of that. Didn't understand why that was happening. He didn't have a clue of what was happening or why it was happening. But this he knew. His life was in the hands of God. And because of that knowledge, even in his confusion, he remains faithful to the Lord, confident that God had a plan for his life, and Job knew that that plan was perfect in every way, and that gave him the strength in the midst of that to get up, to get to a place of worship, bring his heart, renting his mantle, sitting down in the, in the ashes and worshiping God. None of us like waiting. I said that at the beginning. You may say you do, but if given the alternative, you wouldn't choose it. If you were told you're going to go eat at a restaurant or going to go to the doctor, and now I've got two options. You can sit there and wait for an hour to be seen or to be seated at a table, or I can guarantee you'll get in as soon as you walk in the door. Every one of us would choose. Don't you kid yourself. You know you good. You ain't that good at waiting. None of us like waiting. But yet God's word clearly tells us to wait patiently for the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. Now this has been a life verse for many of you. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity. Plans to give you a future and a hope. So I believe today on this, on this Thursday, on this rainy Thursday it is now, on this Thursday afternoon, I believe every one of us have a choice to make. We can resent having to wait for God's plan to come to fruition, or we can accept it and try to get good at it. Because we can't, we can't avoid it. The trouble is sometimes we, we forget the fact who God is in our life and who we are in this big scheme of things. Can I, can I tell you a quick story as we're closing? I read this from the line, from the pen of Dr. David Jeremiah, in one of his books, he tells a story of, of the great New England preacher, Phillips Brooks. Uh, Phillips Brooks was, was known for his calmness, his, his poise, the demeanor about him. Uh, his in, in, intimate friends, though, knew that, that he suffered moments of great frustration, moments of great irritability. And one day, uh, one of his friends saw uh, Phillips Brooks pacing up and down the floor like a caged lion. And somebody asked him, I said, what's the trouble, Dr. Brooks? And here was the reply of that great New England preacher. He says, the trouble is that I'm in a hurry and God isn't. Does that not sound like us? I'm in a hurry. I need to see this thing come to fruition. I need to see this thing solved. I need to get through this. I'm in a hurry, but God doesn't seem to be. The Bible holds the most wonderful promise regarding the plan of God compared to our plan and how we wait for his plan. We read it at the beginning, and I, and I think it's uh, suitable for me to leave you with today. Hear me closely, my friend. When it comes to the plans of God, resting in the plan of Almighty God, Isaiah tells you this again. 
They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the first line in that great promise of encouragement, the great line of strength, the great hope of, 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 of provision, the first line, they that wait upon the Lord. There's a great song of the church that we've seen oftentimes and has its essence, a prayer of surrender. And I leave you today humming these words with me. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Thank you for tuning in today for another midday moment. May the Lord bless you, make his face to shine on you. Look forward to seeing you Friday at high noon for another midday moment. I love you. Bye-bye.